it's time for Past Access, a barrier-free tour through history. Now, here's your host, Pete Coleman. February at dusk, RAF Lancaster swing their way toward Dresden in a massive blow involving more than 800 heavy bombers. A new type German scarecrow bomb explodes in midair, simulating a direct hit on a bomber. Between February 13th and 15th, 1945, over 800 British and American bombers laid waste to the city of Dresden. The destruction from the Allied high explosive bombs and incendiary devices was devastating to the city and her inhabitants, killing over 25,000 people and creating a deadly firestorm. This bombing left Dresden in ruins, yet she would rise from the ashes many decades later with domestic and international assistance under a unified German flag. To most of the world, mention Dresden, and what comes to mind is the horrific effects of World War II. But there is so much more to this interesting city and her history a gleaming city along the Elbe. Welcome to Past Access. I'm your host, Pete Coleman from Dresden, Germany. This town uh, is an amazing town when it comes to some of the great history that you see. And it's also a town about rebirth. After the 1945 bombings, this town was in rubble. It was in ruin. Uh, tens of thousands of, of, of civilians dead. It took decades under communist rule for this place to be built again, and it wasn't really seen to its grandeur as we see today until after the reunification of Germany. And what we see here after the Christmas markets is more of a subdued sort of crowd, uh, but uh, even though we're not showing you the Christmas uh, festivities that Dresden's known for, I think that we'll be able to give you a great uh, ideas about some of the, the historical aspects of, of Dresden, including probably the more more prominent aspect of the firebombing of February 13th, 1945. So join us on this episode of Past Access. Welcome to Germany. Today you can take in the rebuilt Baroque beauty of this old town, strolling through the gardens and fountains at Zwenger Palace, or take in the state opera or ballet at the Simpa Opa. Dresden's architecture was meant to be an homage to Florence, Italy, and today you can still see the intent. Yet, if we could wheel back through time, Dresden would be a very different place. Dresden's name is of Slavic origin and was known as Dresdzani, which means forest dwellers on the plain. Fortifications were built around the settlement in the late 12th century. But like most European cities, the people of Dresden dealt with witch burnings, religious reformations, and deadly plagues. Two cities sprung up, known as Old and New Towns, Neuenstadt, being more Germanic on the right bank of the Elbe River, was once called the Old City, as confusing as that sounds, while the left bank was a sleepy Slav fishing village. Both would become Dresden in 1550 when the bridge was built. Walking down towards uh, the Elbe River and uh, going through this part of Dresden, it is actually amazing to me that what you see behind me is this mural of all of the past uh, rulers of, of Dresden and Saxony. And uh, if you look to each one, they're, they're, they're noticed to be, you know, uh, nicknamed the brave, the bold, the fat, the lazy. <laughs> there's, there's all these guys of these monikers uh, that the German people have given to their past rulers. Uh, it really is kind of neat to see uh, this cavalcade of, of rulers here. Uh, maybe not unlike that you would see something in Budapest in their, their uh, plaza of heroes. Right behind this is the royal stables that was used by Augustus the Strong. Uh, and again, when you talk about this part of Dresden, the rebuilt part, of course, um, the original was, was put together by Italian Renaissance uh, sculptors and, and architects that Augustus the Strong um, really set, sought after to make Dresden a seat of power, of pageantry. And that's really his fingerprints on this town. If you had to place a face to the Baroque prominence of this Florence by the Elbe, it would be that of Augustus the Strong. Inspired by art and architecture of the late Florentine Renaissance, 
Augustus II, married this bygone era with the brilliance of Baroque culture. He is mainly responsible for Saxony becoming the hotspot for art and cultural refinement, as seen in the beautiful Old Masters Gallery. Speaking of a piece of work, that is exactly what Augustus the Strong really was, a piece of work. Much like his golden statue, he stood out among his royal peers. Augustus II ruled over the Saxony region between 1670 and 1733, and after converting to Catholicism, ruled over Poland as well. This dynamic leader boasted great strength, unequal diplomacy with the Ottomans, and being royally virile, siring over 300 illegitimate children. Some say he had a very good publicist to spin these many exploits. You can choose not to believe the rumors that he could break iron horseshoes with his bare hands, alone brokered a wealthy peace with the Turks, or had numerous mistresses. But what is undeniable is that he brought an unparalleled rise in culture, art, and architecture to Dresden. The 17th century was truly a high point in Dresden's history. As we venture to the Royal Palace of Dresden, I notice the cobblestones are not too much of an issue for my chair, and sidewalk curb height is manageable in this pedestrian-friendly town. There are several accessible entrances to the Royal Palace Museum, and the staff is quite helpful, directing towards the lifts. It is here that you really feel a sense of Dresden's grandeur through her treasures. Knights in armor plating, ceremonial swords, Turkish prizes of war, and priceless jewels from the Green Vault are all on display. Plan for several hours to fully get a feel for this stunning museum. From one great museum to the next, we hit the road to get on mass transit to jump to the other side of the river towards the suburbs of Neuenstadt to tour the exhibits of Germany's military past. But before we do that, let's pause for our installment of Past Access Travel Tips. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. When you do rail travel in, in Europe, especially Central Europe, you're gonna have to give 48 hours notice before you do anything. So preparation is key if you're going in a wheelchair. And I'll tell you why. Some of the trains that you're gonna get on are older trains and they require a, um, a hand cranked lift that you have to get on that has to be organized together and for whatever reason they need 48 hours. They really don't need 48 hours. They can do it on the fly if they choose not to. You just need to be prepared. Some of the newer trains have, have lifts already installed in the train itself, so any um, steward or uh, a person that's running the train for you can actually just push a button and it will get you on in a very futuristic way, which is great. But not all trains are equipped. So like we found out here in Dresden, you have to be on top of your game and you gotta think ahead. Like I said, 48 hours notice when you take the train. The Bundeswehr Military History Museum, reopened in 2011, is located on the old military arsenal in the Albertstadt. Fully wheelchair accessible, these exhibits provide detailed Prussian and German military history with artifacts rarely seen outside of Germany. Armament from the Thirty Years' War, weapons used in the Franco-Prussian conflicts, and artifacts from both world wars are presented in great detail. Interactive exhibits also bring history to life for the young and old alike. Many of the interactive terminals are low enough for wheelchair viewing and access. Definitely a plus for me. One particular exhibit caught my eye from World War II. Right behind me is a wing and a, and a wheel here of a P-51 Mustang that was shot down and uh, landed in a lake near here uh, in Saxony. Um, and. Uh, the P-51 was very important for, for daylight precision bombing, escort services for the B-17s, uh, especially of the 8th Air Force. So we're doing sorties back and forth from England uh, across all of Germany, bombing cities and factories. 
Um, this escort allowed um, the bombers a, a better chance of getting back in one piece. That didn't always happen, but the Luftwaffe had their hands full with this amazing aircraft. And this piece was shot down and found in 1980 uh, in, a, in the bottom of a lake and put in this museum. And uh, you kind of really think about what pilot flew this particular aircraft that uh, had that scary moments of having to crash land um, after being shot down. So, unique piece of uh, military hardware for sure. The aim of the Bundeswehr Museum is not to necessarily celebrate war, but to better understand it. The reasons for war never quite cover the human cost for such conflicts, a subject matter not lost on the German people after a disastrous 20th century. Viewing the few remnants left from the 1945 bombing of Dresden, you can and should let the moment sink in. The museum allows for these moments of reflection through the entire complex, a must-stop for those interested in military history. Back in the Altstadt, or Old Town of Dresden, we find our way to the most iconic landmark of the city, the Frauenkutsche. The Church of Our Lady hosts one of the largest domes in Europe and is stunning inside and out. In the years following the 1945 Allied bombings, the church was purposely left in ruins, more to Cold War politics of the day than anything else. But by the late 1990s, a reunified Germany helped to raise funds and accepted millions of euros from American and British organizations to complete the rebuild. The Church of Our Lady was open to holy services and tours in 2005, to the tune of 180 million euros. The wheelchair entrance can be found in the form of an outdoor lift at entrance A. Ring the bell for service and an attendant will make sure you get in. Disabled entry is free, but donations are gladly accepted. Once inside, the Baroque decorations and pastel color scheme would make any modest Lutheran blush, but the plans to rebuild her in the true 18th century glory was paramount. The colors and open space make a lasting impression. The Frauenkutsche is a true testament to rebirth through fellowship and generosity following the horrors of the Second World War. Back outside, you can examine the discolored and blackened original stonework used in the reconstruction, as well as a monument to those destructive three nights in February 1945. I'm sitting in front of a very interesting uh, relic from 1945, and it's actually a piece of the dome of uh, the Frankocha that fell over. Now, when the bombing happened on the 13th of February, followed up by successive other bombings that, that week uh, in 1945, it was, um, the church did its best to stand tall. Uh, it eventually collapsed, and part of the dome is what's right behind me here, and it's permanently here. I want you to keep this in mind, though. It was left as a, as a reminder for political issues that the, the Allies were not the friends of the German people. And because of that, uh, this place was a, a permanent disaster area. You, you can see from the outside of it, looking at, at, the, at the church, that there's black brick as well as white brick. The black brick is what the original part of the church that was firebombed used to uh, put this thing back together again. Again, uh, pretty heavy to deal with, but um, it's part of the tour of, of uh, Dresden and it's part of the history we have to look at. The number of civilians killed was staggering. The conventional bombs did considerable damage to the city, but it was the incendiary munitions dropped on Dresden that created something from Dante's Inferno. A 15 square mile window of destruction claimed a majority of the 25,000 plus lives in those three days. A firestorm had been created and raged through much of the city, consuming lives through fire and lack of oxygen. The reasons for the near complete annihilation of Dresden by allied forces is still debated today. The numbers killed in the bombings also became a political football for various reasons during the Cold War, once ranging from 135,000 killed on the high end to the more currently accepted 25,000 estimated death toll. Nevertheless, disturbing numbers in a world at war. Wheeling through the streets and markets, you may not see the muted historical references to the bombing, but with a keen eye, you could come across a memorial or two. We're really kind of going back in time to what was completely rubble. We're at ground zero, right about right here. Um, we're getting to an area that uh, was completely firebombed where the firestorm had created uh, this whirlwind of, of sucking out oxygen out of the air. 
uh, which was caused by the 600,000 incendiary bombs that were dropped by the RAF and the United States 8th Air Force um, in a matter of several days. And um, what was hard is this, was, this place was completely destroyed into rubble um, and the people that were found in, 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 in places uh, just trying to find some uh, good air were suffocated to death. Uh, that weren't burned alive. So you talk about a grotesque situation. That's what it was um, Can't really see that today here uh, The city completely had been rebuilt, but in our memories in our collective memories We need to remember that uh, that this was a, a, a scene of devastation Let's go Market and this is a scene that um, is something that many people that were ever alive to see it would never forget. Uh, one in, in particular that's very quiet monument is a, a sketching on the ground, uh, an impressment in between the cobblestones, has to deal with, well, basically the bodies that were recovered. 6,000 bodies of, of civilians um, were buried in one place. Well, not actually buried, they were actually burned. Uh, they were stacked in, in a giant heap of human remains right, behind, right in front of me, right here in this uh, Old Town Market. Um, and they were burned for sanitary reasons and also issues of, of trying to rebuild and, and move past um, th that devastation. The book Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut provides a first-hand account through his fictitious character Billy Pilgrim. Semi-autobiographical, Vonnegut recalls his time as an American POW during the bombing raid of Dresden. This 1969 science fiction novel was a New York Times bestseller and introduced the world to Vonnegut's wit and sardonic humor and at the same time questions the philosophies of fate and the folly of war. His protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, um, witnessed the bombing of Dresden as an American POW. His viewpoint is in Pilly, Billy Pilgrim. Uh, because he lived through the same thing as a POW and saw the devastation of, of removing corpses and it changed him forever. And that's the book that came out in the late 1960s, Slaughterhouse-Five. And one of the things that he mentioned at, when he talked about the death of, of someone that he cared for or just the death of someone in his, in his uh, journeys, he would always end it, and so it goes. And I think that's probably the best thing to end here tonight when we talk about Dresden and its history. Sure, there was some great history here, but really what stands in the shadow of, of all histories when you talk about Dresden is the firebombing of 1945. And so we can say, and so it goes. So for Past Access, I'm Pete Coleman. Thank you for watching, and remember, we're history. You have been listening to Past Access with Pete Coleman. For more information on the show or insight to disabled access at historic locations, please visit us at pastaccess.com.